come and see either me and Matteo. If you have suggestions for improvement, if you have complaints or things like that, talk directly with the teaching assistant. Okay? So re please remember that today there is a poster session. So those of you who have not yet displayed the poster, the poster boards are are are, are, are they are there. So you clearly see them and there are numbers. So I don't, I don't know whether you have been assigned a number or otherwise uh, occupy ab abusively whatever space you like, okay? But please uh, uh, display the poster and be there and participate actively. It is a uh, uh, good opportunity for you. Um, and, then, uh, and then that's it. Okay. So enjoy the lecture. Okay, thank you. Okay, good, good morning to everybody. Um, so today the... I will start with, with, with some uh, preliminaries on, on, on random walks and, and Brownian motions and levy flights and all these kind of things. Um, the main motivation for that uh, is the, f the following, basically. We have seen before that, uh, basically, I, 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 I've, I've done in the previous lectures, uh, I don't, I've done in, in details uh, Uh, the extreme statistics for IID random variables, and I've shown you that we have a uh, fairly complete description of it, uh, and we can actually, we have a lot of tools, a lot of results are, are available there, and in particular, we have seen the existence of these three universality classes, uh, Gumbel, Frechet, and, 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 and Weibull, and then, uh, I ended the, the, um, my lecture yesterday by saying that um, these uh, results for IID uh, are actually relatively robust and can be extended uh, to the case of weakly correlated random variables. And uh, I mentioned uh, two examples. Uh, first, uh, one, the first one at the rather heuristic level, which was this, uh, the case where you have uh, random variables which are exponentially correlated. And I did this uh, kind of uh, weird space blocking arguments uh, to convince you that uh, one can still apply the, stat the extreme statistics for IAD in that case. And then I gave you uh, one of uh, the results uh, um, that, we, that, that is known in that context, which is the case where you have, when, when you have a Gaussian uh, stationary process. And in that case, if the correlations decay uh, faster than one over log n, um, then basically uh, you are back to this, to this case. But on the other hand, uh, on the first lecture, I gave you some, uh, some hints, and I gave you so, so some, some concrete examples uh, where um, strong correlations are actually uh, important, although I didn't describe any uh, models in details. Uh, that means that uh, instead of having, uh, basically, correlations that are uh, decaying, uh, you might have, uh, in some cases, growing correlations, or at least there are uh, systems uh, that don't uh, that don't uh, really uh, that are not described by this uh, realm of uh, independent uh, random variables, and uh, there are value systems uh, which are uh, quite interesting uh, in, in in this in this context. And basically, during the the, the, the last years, uh, people have uh, tried to uh, investigate uh, specific systems where one can do some uh, uh, concrete computations of the extreme statistics. Uh, the, re the main reason for that is the following, is that have you have seen, as, as, you, as, you, as, as I showed you, or told you, uh, in this case, uh, you see, I mean, we have very powerful results that show you some different, a finite number of universality classes. Um, now, on the other hand, uh, when you leave this, uh, this realm of uh, IID random variables, it's not very clear uh, what these different universality classes are. It's not even clear that there is only a finite number of them. And 
the idea uh, that people have pursued is basically to try to, to study some uh, specific examples, uh, which are, of course, uh, relevant for physical applications, and for which you can actually obtain exact results, if you want. And uh, among these, uh, these, uh, these families, uh, actually there is only a restricted number, unfortunately, of systems for which one can say precise things, uh, but there are two of them. Uh, the first one uh, is the context of, I mean, is, is, are, are the models related to random walks? And this is relatively wide. I mean, this uh, also uh, concerns levy flights in general uh, and various other stochastic processes. Of course, uh, the continuum part, quantum part would be uh, Brownian motions and their extensions. So that's one first big uh, subject. Uh, and some of those stochastic processes actually belong to this list for which you can obtain exact results. And there is another uh, big subset of, of systems, if you want, uh, for which uh, exact, result, uh, exact results for, uh, I, so for extreme statistics uh, have been obtained uh, is the, 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 the big subject or the big topic of uh, random uh, matrices, big in the sense that uh, there are actually many matrix, uh, different matrix models, and there are many various systems uh, related to them for which uh, people and related models for which uh, exact results uh, became available relatively recently during the last 20 years, say. Uh, and that's, so this is not an exhaustive list. There are some other problems for which you can get exact results. But that's basically the, 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 the two kinds of uh, families of models that uh, I would like to, um, to study. And in fact, I will mainly focus on this one, because I think that uh, application-wise, uh, this is certainly uh, quite, quite interesting for, for, for many of you. Um, and that's, uh, that's what I want to, uh, to start uh, to study uh, right now. And then, uh, if I have time, and I hope I will have, uh, I will then mention this, but that will be certainly, uh, so that will be a first part, and that will be second, second priority if I have time. OK. So since I want to, to talk about that, uh, I thought that before really going to the extreme statistics of, 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 this, of these problems, uh, let me just, uh, I, I, I thought it could be useful just to make some preliminary remarks, uh, reminders uh, about uh, random walks, uh, random motion, and levy flights, and uh, let's start with that. Okay. So I will recall some well-known, but, but also some uh, not so well-known uh, properties. So random walks. I just want to, I mean, to, to give you clear uh, ideas and definitions about what these ob probabilistic objects are. I'm sure you have seen them, of course, but uh, Right, so that's, that will be, the, okay, I guess, uh, the, the, the main topic of, of today. Okay, so let's start with some definitions so that we are sure that we are all talking the same language, at least uh, when we talk about random walks. Um, so, so what I will call and what we, we usually call uh, a random walk is, if you want, is the simplest uh, Markov chain, uh, discrete time Markov chain, uh, which is the following. So uh, you have some variable uh, x. Uh, you start with x0 equal to 0. And then you evolve uh, according to this uh, simple uh, Markovian, Markovian rule here. OK, so that's uh, under this form here. And now this. Uh, Eta n's here, uh, they are IID random variables, OK? And they will be drawn uh, from a PDF, OK, which I will denote P of eta, OK? Now, 
here uh, in this talk, I mean this talk, in these lectures, uh, I should say, um, I will mainly focus on the case where P of eta is symmetric. I mean, this is just to, uh, to keep it uh, as simple as possible, but many of the things that I will, I will, I will say do extend uh, to non-symmetric distribution, but let's, let's start because it's Okay, so that we will have a P of eta is equal to P of minus eta, so essentially the mean of, of, of eta ends is just zero, okay? So if I, if I look at the, the mean value of eta n is just zero. I don't, I don't say any specific things about the, the second moment of eta n, and I will just uh, go, I mean, be more, more specific uh, in a moment, but in principle, so that's my, in principle, that's my definition for four random walk, okay? So I will mainly focus here also on one dimensional case, but uh, again, many things can be done in higher D, but okay, one, one has to start with something, and uh, let's start with the simplest case. So typically, I mean, that, that's, that, that's the, the, the thing that will happen, okay? So you start at, uh, so if you look at, at your random walk, it will typically have this kind of shape, right? So you have a first jump here, and you might have a second jump there. Okay, so after n steps, uh, I will end up somewhere here. And so here I just uh, represent x as a function of n, and I started at x0 equals 0. Okay, so there are various uh, random walks that are actually, uh, that can be studied. Uh, and for ex let me just uh, mention some, some few examples. So now you, you can see that, that the random walk is then completely specified by, by this distribution here. So each type of distribution will, in principle, uh, correspond to uh, a different kind of, of a random walk. Uh, first example, and probably the most common one, is the case where these eta n's are just Gaussian random variables. So let's, for instance, just remind uh, one could have this. Uh, That's one example. Uh, another example uh, could be, for instance, uh, uh, the exponential distribution. But now, compared to what we have studied before, uh, the, the distribution is, is, is symmetric. So I need to consider this kind of exponential distribution. OK, so it has an exponential tail on both sides. Another case, of course, could be uh, uh, because we have studied that uh, already a bit before, which would be the case of a uniform distribution. So that could be, for instance, uh, P of eta. OK, I don't want to write it because it's a bit cumbersome, but uh, just draw it. Uh, that could be something like that. OK, so zero outside and just one in the middle, but symmetric. OK, so these are three, uh, three uh, nice examples. You might also, one case uh, that I will probably discuss a bit less, but still uh, it's, it's, it's present and it's nice to, uh, to have it in mind, is the discrete, discrete random walk. So that's the case where basically eta n can just be plus one or minus one. So this belongs to that, I mean, this is also described by this, uh, by this case, and this corresponds to the, to the fact where you would have two Dirac deltas one in minus one, and one in plus one. Okay, so that's the simple one or more on Z. Okay, on the, but these are well, uh, well defined examples. Now, in all these these cases, um, what is uh, what do they have in common? They have in common that if you look at the the moments, uh, well, the first moment is zero. But if you look at the second moment, say eta square, the variance, then in all these cases, uh, so in these cases, uh, one to four, uh, sigma square is well defined. So if you, if you compute uh, basically this guy, mm -hmm. the second moment of this distribution is finite, right? This is quite obvious in all these cases. This integral is perfectly, uh, is perfectly 
uh, well, uh, well defined. And that means that uh, if you look at the, the large n behavior of this random walk, so if you look at how it looks like when n uh, will become large, uh, what will happen is that in all these cases, you will observe a diffusive behavior. That means that if you look at the typical scale of xn after n time steps, xn will typically be proportional to square root of n. And in fact, we can even be more precise. It will be proportional to sigma square root of n when n is large. OK? Well, that's a fairly important, uh, quite important remark here. So all these random walks, if you want, to some extent, if you look at them uh, on the large time limit after a large number of steps, they will roughly uh, look the same. Now let's consider uh, a, another example here of, of random walks defined by this Markov chain, which, is, which differs from, from all these ones by the fact that uh, the random walk, or the, the, sorry, the, the, the distribution uh, might have, uh, so this is the last example, which will be quite, uh, quite, quite important also in, the, in this context. Sorry. We, yes, sorry. Even if the mean is non-zero, yes, 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 of course. OK, I mean, in that case, uh, <clears throat> so if you put, so for instance, uh, if the, suppose that the mean of the, of the jumps is non-zero, so I don't know, let's take this one, but uh, suppose that it's centered to some finite value. So that effectively means that you have an external drift, so it's an external force. So basically, the, the equation of motion that, that you would have would be something like xn is equal to x minus, xn minus 1 plus c plus eta n. So c would be a finite number, and eta n again would be centered. But so in this case, of course, to leading order, xn, again, in these examples, in this case, xn would be proportional to n, right, if you have an external drift or if you have a non-zero non mean. So it will be deterministic. The leading term would be deterministic, so that means that your worker would really just uh, follow the drift. But the fluctuations around this drift will be again given by square root of n. That's true, OK? Provided, of course, sigma is finite, OK? OK, so let's consider another case, which is the case where uh, P of eta has a fat tail. OK, so if you look at the limit when eta, sorry, when eta uh, goes to plus or minus infinity, it's symmetric. And let's consider the case where alpha is strictly smaller than 2. Then obviously, in that case, uh, this second moment is not defined, right? Because if you compute, uh, say, sigma square, and you start to do this guy, to do this, this integral, sorry, eta square times p of eta, then obviously you see that at large values of eta, this behaves like 1 over uh, 1. So this thing here. For large values of eta, you see that uh, it just behaves like uh, eta um, to the power, basically, uh, right, so to the power uh, 1 uh, minus alpha. And this, obviously, uh, when alpha is strictly smaller than 2, is non-integrable. Okay, so that tells you that this integral here, so this is for when, when eta goes to plus infinity. And obviously, as soon as, e, as alpha is smaller than 2, this integral is just diverging. Okay? And it's just not defined. So this p of eta in this case, because alpha. And that actually uh, creates uh, a large, I mean, a substantial difference uh, compared to what happens here. And this type of random walks here, they actually called uh, Levy flights. Okay. Yes. 
No, there is no, there is, so in this case, you don't have, uh, you, you don't have uh, a Brownian motion, but still there is a continuum limit. You can still define a continuum limit, but the system is, 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 a, is quite different. I will probably comment on that. The trajectories of these Levy flights is discontinuous. Okay, you have jumps, okay, contrary to what happens for Brownian motion, for which the trajectory is indeed continuous. Levy flights have discontinuous uh, trajectories, and I will probably comment a little bit uh, a little bit on that uh, in a while, okay? But in one important, uh, at, at, at this stage, uh, the thing that I want to say is that in that case, you don't have any more uh, diffusive behavior, but if you look at the typical scale of xn when n is large, that will be of the order n to the power one over alpha. Okay. So that's quite different compared to the square root of n, and that's typically much larger than n to the one half, which is the diffusive behavior. So generically, these Levy flights, they display what is called super diffusive behavior. Okay? It means that they go faster than square root of n. So now let's try indeed to see and to give uh, a bit more precise definition of this uh, of this of this guy and try to see what happens uh, in in the limit of of large n. Yes. Okay. So with this kind of model, you cannot get uh, any uh, and I mean sub diffusive behavior. One way to do it is to construct, but I guess I will not construct too much, discuss too much this 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 thing. But what you can do uh, is use this, what is called under the name uh, of continuous, I mean, continuous time uh, random walk. So what you, what you are doing uh, is that you perform a random walk, but between each step, between each step, you're waiting some time, some random time. And this time will be distributed according to some power law. And depending on the power law that you have, you can get sub-diffusive behavior. Okay, so you do a first jump, then you wait some time, it can be, uh, short, it can be very long, it's also a random variable, and then you perform the jump. Okay. So this is called a subordinator, uh, uh, and this can yield uh, sub-diffusive behavior. I guess I will not touch too much upon that, but it's also interesting, of course. Okay, so let's try to understand and describe a little bit better what happens in the continuum limit, and let's focus first on this fourth, uh, first case. And uh, these are, uh, and of course, uh, the, 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 they correspond to the to a Brownian uh, to the Brownian limit. Okay, so let's just derive and be a little bit more precise about uh, what, what is it, what, what it is. Sorry. So let's let's uh, consider this uh, these first two cases. And what I want to discuss uh, is the case of, I mean, is the what is called the Brownian, Brownian limit. Okay, so what, what I mean by that, uh, again, there is one thing to, to notice. Uh, you remember that before we were looking at the collection of random variables, uh, which were IID. Now here we are considering something a bit different, which is Xn, which is this guy, but you immediately see that uh, Xn now can be written as the sum of these uh, of these eta i's, okay? This is quite simple. But of course now, so these eta i's are IID random variables, but now you have a set, so these extents here are themselves the sum of IID random variables, and obviously they are not independent. That's quite simple to see. I mean, let's just do this simple computation. Well, if you compute the, the average of Xn, I mean, obviously, this will be the sum of these eta i's. That's obviously 0. Okay, They are all 0, and I have a finite number of them, so it's obviously 0. But now what is more interesting is to compute, say, the, the, the two-point correlation. Okay, So let's consider this Xn, uh, Xn prime, and then uh, you see that let's write it explicitly. So Xn is just the sum from 1 to n of, so 
yeah, of, uh, and then you will you will have a second sum uh, over j from one to n prime, and that will be eta i eta j. Now, this these run these, these numbers here themselves the, these eta i's are indeed uncorrelated. So if you compute the correlations, the, this will be simply a delta i j. Okay, so this is zero if i is different from j. And this has some value, and the value is precisely sigma square, right? This is what I call sigma square, okay, the second moment. So now you see that uh, you have this uh, second sum to, uh, you have this double sum, but you have here this delta ij. So suppose that uh, n is larger than uh, or great, greater uh, or equal than, than n prime. So then you will see that basically this is just the sum from i equal to n to n prime. But this delta ij is just one, but so that, that selects only, uh, so that reduces this double sum to a sing single sum. And so you simply, have, you simply have the sum from i equal to n prime of sigma square, and this is just sigma square times n prime. Right? So that tells you that indeed this is a, this series is, is, is strongly correlated, right? Because the correlations you see, I mean, they are not decaying at all. Uh, as a function of n, uh, this is just a constant, and as a function of n prime, uh, this is uh, this is increasing. So we are far from the examples that, uh, that 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 we have treated below. Now, how does the trajectory typically look like? Uh, well, in this case, uh, if you really look at uh, what happens uh, on the large scale. Uh, limit, well, you will see this typical uh, Brownian, uh, Brownian type of, of, uh, of uh, motion. So again, I mean, maybe I should really stress here uh, that uh, that means that this extends and extends prime. Okay, they are really strongly correlated, right? Uh, okay, I didn't write it because probably most of them will not <laughs> see it, but. Uh, that's that's the, the, the conclusion for now. So let's go back to that. So typically, what will I mean? What will happen if you really look at uh, the large end limit? Uh, you start at zero, and you will have this kind of uh, of, uh, of motion, right? This kind of. Uh, I guess you have seen many times. Okay, so the trajectories uh, look continuous, and they typically uh, look like that. Uh, they are quite. Uh, I mean bit rough. I mean, the path itself uh, looks a bit rough, but, but, it, but, but it, is, uh, uh, it is continuous. Now, how do you construct uh, the, the, the Brownian motion limit? Well, what you do is that you define uh, a function x uh, of t, uh, and you will define it this way. So this is x. So you have this, this capital X there. And you just uh, look. Look at them like this. So you, you look at it on a time interval, say, 0n. OK? So this is just the in integer values of nt. So t is, is in between 0 and 1. And then you need to renormalize it, of course, by sigma square root of n. So OK, this is, uh, this, is this object. OK, so I take, so now I, I choose to index Basically, I, I had an interval which goes from 0 to n, and I prefer to work uh, on an interval 0t, which is uh, between 0 and 1. So I just have this random variable here. I divide it by sigma square root of n, because I told you that the typical scale would be of order square root of n. Now, I will take the limit. So the claim is that this guy, uh, in the limit when n goes to infinity, so maybe I should do the other, the other way around. Then this uh, will con converge uh, uh, to a nice object, which is b of t, and which is the Brownian motion. Okay. Now, how it does converge here when n goes to infinity uh, is uh, I leave this to uh, I mean to mathematicians, but of course we can give a precise meaning to that uh, convergence. This convergence is sometimes called what, what is called don't square theorem. I mean, if, if there are some mathematicians among you. Now, this B of t here for us uh, is, is indeed is this Brownian motion. 
what it means is that it satisfies uh, a Langevin equation, which I will write in this way, which is b dot t, which is db dt is equal to eta of t. It starts at 0. B, b of 0 is 1. And this, okay, the eta that is here is the Gaussian white noise. Okay, so that means that eta as a function of t, if you look at it as a function of t, this will just be uh, uh, Gaussian random variables, and it has zero mean. Maybe I will write there. So it has zero mean, so eta of t is zero, and it has delta correlated noise. Yeah, I will take your question. Okay, so this is, okay, I, I use the same notation. It's a kind of continuum ver continuous version of this guy, okay? So I just want, I use uh, indeed the same notation because you see that this, this guy, this, this equation, I can roughly, I mean, I can again write it is equal to eta n, okay? Now, in the continuum limit, basically this xn minus xn minus one will be derivative with respect to n, which is a derivative with respect to t, and this eta of n which will translate into this eta of t. Okay, so that's the continuum version of this of this random variable. Okay. I will maybe uh, comment on this uh, uh, in a minute. So basically, uh, I will then say, roughly speaking, uh, how you do implement this uh, numerically, uh, and somehow you have to come back to that, to that kind of equation. I will be a little bit more explicit. Yes? Oh, yes. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, it's one. Uh, it's one because I did this normalization here. I, I, I divided by sigma square root of n. Okay? So if you don't do this sigma, if you don't divide by sigma, so that's one difference indeed between the eta and uh, this eta of t and this eta n. Uh, this one has variance sigma square. This one has variance one, so basically they are related by uh, one over sigma. Uh, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's 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 the point, indeed. So that that's the, the somehow that that that's really the main point, is that uh, no matter what you had for the the distribution of the eta ends, you end up in the large end limit to this Brownian motion. Okay. So that's that's a crucial point. Uh, this convergence here is independent. So that's, of course, independently, independently of P of eta. So, yeah, of course, as soon as, that, as you have a sigma, huh? yeah, with, uh, okay, but I am in this, in this context here, Brownian limit, uh, sigma square finite. Yeah. So, yeah, one, okay, there is one way to see it which is relatively simple. If, if you look at xn here on this sum, you see that xn as a, at, a, at a given time n is just the sum of iid random variables. This iid has a finite uh, second moment, and that means that if you look at it as a finite, finite n, it will be Gaussian. Okay, so x, x, the distribution of xn will be square root of n times a Gaussian. Now it's a bit less clear uh, that it's true for the, the process itself. So that means that so that's, that holds. So if you really want to understand this at a finite time, this is simply the central limit theorem that everybody knows. Now, if you really want to look at the process, that means, for instance, if you I mean can now justify the fact that these two-point correlations will indeed converge to the correlations given by the Brownian motion and invent higher order correlations, then of course this is a high, highly non-trivial theorem, and this is known under the name of the Donsker. This is Donsker theorem, okay? So that's a very important piece of uh, probability theory, uh, which goes beyond 
uh, beyond the central limit theorem, okay? And I will, of course, not. Uh, I will take it for granted. Okay? So that's the, uh, that's the case of Brownian, Brownian, Brownian limit. Now, let me say something a little bit more uh, qualitative about the Levy flights. Right. First, for the Levy, so one remark is that you see, I mean, this, 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 this trajectory is here in the continuum limit. They are actually continuous, okay? I mean, this is more or less uh, uh, written here. Now, if you look at the Levy flights in the large end limit, uh, you can also give a continuous description of it. I will not do it because it's a little bit uh, more involved. But let me just give you the picture. And in fact, from my point of view, when you have to do, when you have to work with Levy flights, uh, it's usually much more convenient to work with a discrete time one or more uh, limit and then take the large end limit when you can. But this is much more, uh, much more uh, simple. So let's just, uh, the case of Levy flights. And just to, to point out the difference with this kind of trajectories, uh, when n goes to infinity. So you remember that in that case, you can you have a very, very fat tails uh, in the distribution of the jumps. And as a matter of fact, uh, what is happening is that, okay, for some time it looks very much like binary motion, and then sometimes you will have some big jumps like that. Okay, so that's typically uh, a Levy flight uh, that uh, you would uh, that you would get in the large end limit. Okay, so that's uh, quite different. Uh, but again, so it admits uh, a representation in terms of. Uh, I mean, you see that it's it's a kind of composition of uh, locally some Brownian motion, and then sometimes uh, you have these jumps. Okay, but the full description is a bit. Uh, um, involved, and uh, my uh, recommendation is that usually in these cases, it's much more easy, it, it's, it's, it's really much easier to work with the, with the discrete, discrete, discrete one or more. Okay, so that's kind of description of the, of, of, of the process. Now, and these, these were mainly definitions. Now, let's go to, uh, to introduce some, some tools to describe this, uh, the, this, this probabilistic uh, object, okay? So uh, a central tool to, dis to describe this, uh, these quantities uh, and these objects is called the Green's function. Sometimes this is also called uh, uh, propagator, but okay. I want to, to, go, to come back to the discrete, discrete time process. And I want to define uh, what, I will, what I call the free Green's function. Which I, which I will denote uh, by a G, J, sorry, of X, X naught N. So that's the probability density. So X naught is, uh, is the starting point. So you, you are considering a trajectory, basically, uh, that starts at x naught and that ends at x, roughly speaking. And so this guy, so this is a density, so now if you look at uh, dx of that, then this is the probability that uh, the worker uh, is in, within the interval x, x plus dx, given that it started at x naught. So this is probably the worker is in x plus dx after n steps, given that it started at x naught, at x at, at t equals zero. Okay, so that's basically you ask this question. You have your your random walk. Uh, now it can actually start anywhere, not necessarily at zero if you want. Okay, so now I, I ju just chose this this case. It start at x naught, and uh, after some time n it will be in x, and you ask the probability for such, for such an event. Right? So that's a very important, very important object, obviously. Uh, now, this is a probability, so it's normalized, and it's normalized such that the integral over x is 1, okay? 
that's important to, to understand that. <laughs> that's w always a good, uh, good rule, I mean, when you are facing uh, some probability, I mean, to ask, ask yourself, how is it normalized? I mean, that's usually uh, how and why is it well normalized. Okay, so by definition here, the normalization is, that is, is just such that. Well, you, you just have the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dx of j, x, x naught, n, is equal to 1 for all n and all x naught. Okay? So that just tells you that basically if you start from x0 after step n, well, you have to end up with probability 1 somewhere. Nice. So now the question is how do, do you compute that? So there is uh, maybe another, uh, so this is normalization, and there is also an initial condition that I want to stress. Uh, you know that at time t equals 0, at time n equals 0, sorry, you are at x naught, so that means that if I look at this quantity at n equals 0, then this should be a delta function around delta, uh, around x naught, okay? So if you look at this, this object, n equals 0, this should be a delta function. Yes. At this stage, maybe it's useful to say that uh, uh, from now on, I will consider the case where the um, distribution of the, um, of the jumps uh, is continuous. Okay, so I exclude from, from now on the plus minus random walk. It can also be done. Uh, usually, there were some uh, difficulties which are due again to this problem that I already mentioned, this kind of dege degeneracy. Uh, so I will just leave it for now. Uh, so everything now is for this, I mean, continuous jumps. So there is no uh, delta function in the, in the density, okay? So the densities are nice, nice, uh, nice functions. So now the question is how do I construct, how do I compute this J? So the, the to compute this, this, this quantity, um, let me show you a uh, quite, quite nice method uh, which uses recursion relation. Okay, and that will be some kind of, that will be a method that, that I will repeatedly uh, use in the following, so that's in, uh, important to understand it uh, right now. So, the idea of uh, constructing recursion relation here uh, is possible thanks to the fact that I have a Markov process. That means that, essentially, uh, if I look at uh, this process here, suppose that I look at what happens right before it, then essentially this last step is completely independent of what happened before. Okay, that's the definition of the Markov chain. And it's also, by construction, it's really written in the, in the equation of evolution, right? Xn is equal to Xn minus one plus eta n, but you don't need to know anything about xn minus two, xn minus three, or whatever. So the recursion relation that, that we are going to write uh, exploits this fact by saying that uh, I will decompose my trajectory uh, first on this uh, n minus one uh, first steps and then see what happens during the last step. So in other words, I will say that the probability to arrive at x after n step, that's the probability to arrive at n minus one in say some value x prime after n minus one steps, and then doing a step, just a single step between x prime and x during the last step. Okay, so that's, that's the idea of this recursion relation. And that's really uh, just expressing in word if you want the Markov, the Markov uh, uh, relation. So let's, let's, let's write it explicitly. Uh, here that simply means that g of x, x naught n uh, is something which is just, so as I said, maybe let's do it this way. So I'm saying that I can start from x naught again and arriving anywhere at x prime in n minus one step. And then I will do some jump basically from x prime to x. So the jump will be x minus x prime. And then uh, I need to integrate over all the possible x prime. Okay. So that's uh, very simple, and uh, I'm sure uh, you have all seen, or most of you have already seen this kind of formula, and this is called uh, 
usually the Kolmogorov equation. And here, uh, I will actually uh, call it uh, a forward Kolmogorov equation. And that's actually uh, quite important. You will see why, because there is another uh, equation, which is called the backward Kolmogorov equation, which actually is much more useful for us. Yeah, so the, 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 the only thing is that there you will have a more complicated object. Okay, you will have the propagator, which is much, much, more, much more complicated. But yes, that's, that, that's, that's, that, that, that basically is the same idea. Yeah. That's true. And in fact, you can also write a path integral for this Brownian motion, of course. That's true. So this is a first observation. Now, uh, the second observation is that mathematically you see that it's a convolution. Okay, I can see it as a convolution, right? Because I have a function of x prime times a function of x minus x prime, and I just integrated over x prime. So I will exploit this structure to solve it exactly uh, uh, in a minute. So that's a convolution. It has a convolution structure. So now, what I was saying is that there is this forward equation, it's nice, but there is also a backward equation, which in fact is much more powerful, and which maybe uh, you haven't seen too much. But the idea is basically the same. It's just, but instead of doing at what happens, um, here you see, I mean, we have sort of investigated what happens during the last step. But we can do the same by focusing on what happens during the first step. Okay. So I will do basically the same. I will say that, okay, uh, I can do exactly the same kind of, um, of argument by saying that uh, the probability to arrive from x naught to x is basically the probability to make just the first step between x naught and x prime zero, and then propagate from x prime zero to x, and then I will have to sum over this first point here. So that's very simple here, and, and at the moment there is no, nothing special, uh, but you will see in a minute that, or maybe not in a minute, but you will see a bit later, uh, that uh, equation. So that's the same. Let's see whether we got it. So what I'm saying is that now I'm just doing first a step from x naught. Okay, let's do the integral afterwards. So I just do a first step from x prime zero to x zero, and this that will happen uh, with some probability p of x prime zero minus x naught, and then I will propagate from x prime zero to x, but now in n minus one steps. Okay, and then what I need to do is basically to integrate over d x prime zero. So they look superficially the same, but in fact they are quite different. And you will see that uh, later on, uh, what I will mainly be interested in are uh, first passage problems. And I will define this uh, more precisely later, but I want already to, to, to emphasize that, uh, is that this approach is very useful uh, when studying first passage. And you will see why. when studying first passage. Okay, now it's a bit too early to, to mention it, but I just advertise it. Okay, so remember that this backward Kolmogorov equation is actually extremely, extremely interesting. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah, so we are just, yeah, so in, in that case, we are just doing this, this thing here, okay? So I'm just looking at what happens during this first step here, okay? So during this first step here, I will just make some jumps between x naught to x prime zero, okay? So I jump from x naught to x prime zero, so that's just the first step. So that's the probability of this first step. You agree? Oh, I see, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you are right. Okay. Well, here, since the jumps are symmetric, in fact, they, they, these are the same, but, but, but you are right, yeah. Okay, so this is nice. Now, how do you solve these equations? 
Well, I already told you how you solve this equation. These are convolutions. So since these are convolutions, I will just use Fourier transform. Okay? So, uh, so I want to compute these, these objects for any n and any jump distribution. Okay? So we want to solve these equations and I can. In this case, you can solve uh, either of the two forward or backward uh, equation, uh, but you want to, uh, to, to solve them. So this is the solution of the Kolmogorov equation via Fourier. Okay, so let me introduce my convention for uh, Fourier transform. So I will just, uh, I will do some, uh, some Fourier uh, with respect to x, right? So I will just uh, write, uh, I will introduce this quantity, j tilde of k, x naught n, which is just uh, exponential a, okay, so that's dx, e i k x, j of x, x naught, and n. OK? So we know, right, that I have these two equations, either this one or that, or that one. They are more, more OK, at this stage, they are, for, for this purpose, they will look the same. So if these are convolutions, so basically, if I look at the Fourier transform, this will transform into products of, so the convolution of, the Fourier transform of a convolution is the product of the convolution, right? Of, so the, the product of Fourier transform, excuse me. So let me introduce this, let me be clear. Let me introduce the Fourier transform of the, of the jumps, okay? So what I know is that if I Fourier transform this, I will just write it. I mean, we, you can work out the details a bit later, but I, I suppose that this should be clear for everyone. So if I do the Fourier transform of that, of this or that equation, uh, what I get is basically that j tilde of k x naught n is just equal to j tilde of k x naught n minus 1 times p tilde of k. That should be clear, right? So now I want to see this as a recursion as a function of n. So it's very simple, right? Because you can just solve it explicitly, right? If I just see this as a function of n only, forget about k and x naught, then it's of the form a n is equal to a n minus one times b. That's pretty simple, right? I mean, this will be only the product of all this and this a n. So in other words, uh, if I want to, uh, to, to, to solve this, uh, you will you will get it, and uh, you can check that this is true. This would be basically uh, uh, up to some constant. This will be uh, p tilde k to the power n. OK? Just can show this recursively uh, if you like. So now, um, now what I want to, how do I fix a? I, I fix a by looking at what its value at n equals zero, right? So a is actually j of tilde, sorry, k x naught at n equals zero. Okay, by definition. But now I need to remember this together with an initial condition. So what is the j tilde? So let's compute it. By definition, j tilde of k x naught n equals zero is just the Fourier transform of the initial condition, okay? So that's minus infinity dx, ei, kx, j of x, x naught, n equal to zero. And this guy is just a delta function, right? Because at x equal to zero, you start at x naught precisely. So this is just some delta function, delta of x minus x naught. And so a eventually is very simple, right? This is just a k x naught. Fine. So now I have an explicit expression for this guy. 
and I can revert or invert this integral. Okay, so <coughs> eventually what you get, so now I invert this, okay, let, let's finish this computation. Let's write, it's finished, but let's write it explicitly. So this is k, x naught n. There are various ways, of course, to obtain this. Uh, I'm not saying that this is the only one, but uh, I like it because uh, this is a kind of method that's, okay, we repeatedly, I mean, we frequently use in this kind of, uh, of equations. And so once you have that, okay, now you can invert this Fourier transform, okay? So, and you immediately get it, okay? So, so this will be the integral dk over 2 pi for minus infinity plus infinity exponential of minus kx plus i k x naught then the tilde k to the power n. Right? And p tilde k, I remember you, is just the Fourier transform of the jump distribution. Okay? So you have an explicit expression. Uh, okay, this is fairly standard, right? I guess many of you have already seen that. Uh, but if you have not seen it, I mean, it's good to see it once. Now, now question is what happens in the large n limit, of course. Okay. So, If you look, so of course, one has to, what happens for larger? Now, what happens for larger n, uh, you see, when n is very large, uh, it depends a little bit on the value of p tilde k, right? Whether it's smaller or greater than one. Now, obviously, uh, this p, p tilde of k is, is strictly, uh, strictly, uh, is smaller or equal than one, right? So p tilde of k, to see that, uh, let's first maybe look at uh, p tilde of zero. Well, p tilde of zero, you see, is just the integral of p of x. Well, just one, right? Because it's normalized. The jump density is normalized, so you just get one. And now, if you look at the, how does this p tilde of k looks like in general, well, you can show that it's, it will be a decreasing function of k. And if you plot it, uh, typically it will look like that as a function of k. So it starts at 1, and then it will decay as a function of k. So that tells you something, that tells you that this integral here, you see, I mean, uh, basically, uh, when k is very large, p tilde of k will be quite small. And if you take this small number to the power n when n is large, then it will be extremely small. So that tells you that this integral here over k is essentially dominated by the small k values where it's close to 1, right? Because as soon as k is too big, basically, this integral of this integrand here will be 0. And so that tells you that this integral here uh, is dominated by small values of k. So in other words, uh, what you want to look at to extract the large n behavior of this Green's function is to look at how this p tilde of k looks like when k is small. Yeah, okay, I, I just tell it, I, I, I just told this to you, okay? I didn't show you, okay. Uh, <clears throat> it's not so complicated, though, I mean, it requires a little bit of work uh, to show that this is a decreasing function of k, but you can, for instance, I think that the best is just to, uh, so for instance, if you take, it's just to look at examples, right? So if you take, an, let's, so for instance, you see that if p of x is a Gaussian, exponential minus k square, then we know that the Fourier transform of a, of, a, of, a, of a Gaussian is itself a Gaussian, so that will be p, of p tilde of k, we, sorry, if you take p of x exponential minus x square, then its Fourier transform will be exponential minus k square. Okay, so that, that will be something that decays. Okay. Uh, and more generally, it, it will always uh, look like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a theorem. Uh, 
if you want to have a nice distribution. Yes? So at the moment, everything is, so now I, uh, that's a good question. Uh, up, up to now, this is exact for any types of jump distributions, okay? Thin or fat types. That's true. But what is different is how this behaves for small k. So the behavior now for small k of p tilde of k will be quite different if you are dealing with uh, uh, fat tails or thin tails. Okay, so now comes the, uh, the, 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 the difference because you want to know the small k behavior of this p tilde of k. So namely, how, how, how it does behave here. So for this, uh, well, you need to, uh, I tell you how, how it is, uh, and then, um, so you need to know something about the small k behavior of p tilde of k. Okay, uh, maybe we can just uh, say, uh, let's see, uh, maybe let's do some uh, simple, simple analysis. So let's consider first the case where sigma square is finite. Now, p tilde of k by definition is this guy. Okay? So let's do a small k expansion of it. It's a bit uncontrolled approximation, but still uh, it's the most natural. So if you want to do a small k, why do we just expand this, uh, this exponential here? So let's expand it. So aikx is just 1 plus ikx, right, minus half k square x square plus ta, ta, ta p of x, right? So and now I suppose that I can just integrate term by term. So first term give me, simply gives me the integral of p of x. That's one. That's what I said before. Now the first term you see is just i k times x p, integral of x p x dx. And this is just the average value of, of eta, and that's just zero, OK? Because the first term is just the first value of, of eta. And then I have a second term, which is minus half k square times eta square plus ta, ta, ta. OK? Can you see that? Can you see here, or it's already too, too low? It's a bit too low already, OK? Uh, yeah, because it's important, so I should uh, take care of it. <laughs> I just wrote this uh, simple uh, expansion, right? But OK, still. So what I claim is that this is just the, the, the expansion of the characteristic function. I mean, so it should not be that. So you see that this guy is 0, OK? And now I'm happy because in this case, I can do that. When sigma is finite, I can actually do that. And because eta square here is well defined. And this is just sigma square. But you immediately see that if I am dealing with fat tails, and now uh, maybe I can answer about more, more precisely your question. Uh, if I have fat tails, obviously I cannot do that because this coefficient here is infinite. So that tells you that basically this uh, expanding here as, as I am doing here is not allowed there. Okay, mathematically I am. Well, here sigma square is finite, so I'm quite happy. So that means that I can write that plus higher order terms. So now let's inject this in that in that uh, so now it's not strictly exact, but minus infinity. So I have dk over two pi. I have exponential of minus k x minus x naught, and then I get this quantity, 1 minus sigma square over 2 k square to the power n. Now I'm saying again, well, I'm dominated by k very small, 
So I can replace that. I can replace this thing because k is small, of course. I have in mind that, again, it's dominated for, for small k. And that's just, I can just replace it by exponential of minus n sigma square over 2 k square. Right? So I'm just re exponentiating this. I'm just using the same trick as we did last time. Right? I'm just using that 1 minus alpha to the power n is exponential minus n alpha. OK? Is that fine? So again, this is correct because k is dominated. I mean, I'm dominated by k, by small k. And more precisely, I am actually dominated by k of order 1 over square root of n. That's why. I am allowed to do that. And so you see immediately that now you are, uh, you are almost done, right? Because what you have to compute, so let's just write it now, is just the Fourier transform of a Gaussian. OK? And you can, of course, uh, evaluate it. And let's put it uh, with all the correct prefactors. Then when you do this integral over k, Again, uh, you have to believe that you are dominated by small k values. I mean, there are much, I mean, there are more controlled ways to do that, uh, which it's not, it's not that complicated, but uh, I hope that you got the, 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 the message here. So eventually what you get is that this quantity here just go to that, right? So it's just 1 over square root of 2 pi n sigma square exponential of minus x minus x naught square divided by 2n sigma square. Right? So that's eventually, so you see immediately that because you have x square divided by n here, so that, that means that the typical scale is actually square root of n. OK? So that immediately tells you that x minus x naught is of the order of sigma square root of n. OK? So that's what I told you before, right? This is the Brownian scaling limit. Okay, that's contained in this equation, right? Because you immediately see that essentially uh, for x minus x naught much larger than square root of n, then basically due to this exponential, this probability will be zero. Okay, so all the weight is concentrated around uh, x minus x naught divided by square root of n. Okay, so if you s start at x naught, then basically you will end up at x which is uh, at a distance of the order sigma square root of n from x naught. Is that clear? There is, of course, a finite probability that you end up anywhere else, but this probability is extremely small when n is large. Right, so what is nice here, you, again, you see that only the second moment actually matters. It's the same kind of calculation that you are doing, probably that you have done when you show the central limit theorem. I mean, that's one way at least to show the central limit theorem. And you immediately see that only the second moment actually holds. Okay. Now you see that this Gaussian here, it appears uh, precisely because I have the right to do that here. Now what about the case of Levy flies? Okay, so what about the case where sigma square is infinite? So there, that's the case of fat tails or Levy flights, and that's okay. Now, it turns out that if you look at what happens close to k equals 0, then uh, what is happening is that, so for instance, uh, so that corresponds to p of eta. So suppose that you have uh, these tails like that for the jumps. Okay? So suppose that the jumps have a power low tails like this with alpha much smaller than 2. Then if you look at the Fourier transform of this guy, there is a theorem, I mean, which is known under the name of the Tauberian theorem. This is one of the Tauberian theorem. Then p tilde of k basically behaves like that. Okay, so that's now quite different. It will behave like this. That's can take it as a, as a theorem. If you have a large eta behavior like this, then you will get a p tilde of k, which is of that form. 
And A actually can be computed in terms of C and some numbers to involve some gamma functions, but uh, that's, 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 the, that, that's the point. And you see that only when alpha is equal to two, you recover the exponential minus k square, but otherwise you have a non-analytic behavior, right? And that's very important. That's very important because now you will insert this behavior there, and instead of having a k square here, you will get a k to the power alpha. And that will give you another function. And this function is an alpha stable distribution. So let's do it quickly here. So you will get that g of x, x naught, is just of that form. Okay, so I'm just doing this, the same thing. I'm re-exponentiating uh, the whole thing, and I get exponential minus a and a k to the alpha. Okay, if, if it goes too fast, I mean, please stop me. I mean, the idea is not to. So if, if, if there is something that is not clear, I mean, please uh, tell it, tell me. Um, is that okay? So now this form here, you, you, you can actually put it uh, in a nicer, I mean, nicer, in a, nicer scaling form uh, if you really uh, want to write it in this way so that you can still write it in this way uh, as, a, as, as this, this kind of scaling form, phi of alpha of x minus x naught and to the power alpha. Okay, so it's just some rewriting, change of variable and rewriting a little bit the things. Uh, so I do I do that? I mean, I just do the change of variable uh, n k to the power alpha is equal n a k to the power alpha is just q to the power alpha, and that will immediately introduce this scale there. And there is a here, sorry. Okay? So this a is given here, and this a actually depends on the, on, on the coefficient, essentially, that you have here. Now, what is this phi alpha? So phi alpha is, uh, is, a, bit, uh, is a bit different, but it has a nice, what, it has a nice um, Fourier representation. So basically, the, its Fourier transform is very simple. Its Fourier transform is just exponential minus k alpha. But let's write it. Uh, so phi alpha of x, uh, that's, that's this expression. dk over 2 pi exponential of minus k to the alpha minus i k x. OK? So that's, is, is that clear? I mean, it's just written there, right? This is just this function. Once you get rid of the n, the a, and, uh, and you put x minus x naught as x, then that's this function that is written there. Agreed? So this function uh, is called an alpha-stable distribution. And it's quite different from a Gaussian. Of course, for alpha equal 2, you recover a Gaussian. OK? This is just a Gaussian. That's what we studied before, right? If I set k equal 2, I'm back to this formula. And we know that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. But in general, for alpha much smaller than 2, this is quite different. And in particular, it also has a power law tail. Okay, so if you look at phi alpha of x as a function of x when, so it's symmetric, of course, when x goes to plus infinity, then this guy actually uh, behaves like x to the power of 1 plus alpha. So it has itself uh, a power law tail. Okay? So that means that if you take a sum of random variables with a fat tail, then basically, the sum itself has also a fat tail with the same exponent. And that's due to the fact that I was mentioning uh, yesterday. That's due to the fact that if you look at this sum of large uh, fat tails random variables, then basically the sum will be dominated by one or two guys. And these one or two guys, of course, has this power law behavior. And that's what you get here. Yeah. 
Yeah, basically, yes. Yeah. Essentially, yes. So in general, for any alpha, it's that there is no closed form expression. There are series expansion. Maybe I can just give you the, the case. There is one case which is nice, which is the case alpha equal to 1, because we have studied it before. For alpha equal to 1, this is the Cauchy distribution. Okay. For alpha equal 1, you can compute this, distrib with this, this. Obviously, I mean, alpha equal 1, you can do this integral. And uh, what you would get is that phi 1 of x is just 1 over pi times 1 plus x squared. So that's the Cauchy. Okay, I hope it's still, you can still read it. Or <laughs> okay, this is Cauchy, right? So I, I don't want to rewrite it, if you don't mind. Uh, it's just 1 over pi times 1 over 1 plus x squared. Okay, it's, it's Cauchy. Uh, yeah, okay, that's a good question. So stable because, uh, why are they stable? Uh, Stable because basically, if you take uh, so uh, if you take two Gaussians, so you, if you take two Gaussians, I don't, um, in fact, even uh, with different variances, but if you sum them, uh, you the, the sum is again a Gaussian, okay, and that's why actually this appears uh, as a limiting form uh, in the I mean in the central limit theorem, uh, but there are also other functions that other distributions that satisfy this property. And this property, these other functions are the alpha stables. Okay, so if you take two alpha stables, they are again stables, and that's the reason why uh, they are limiting. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, they are exactly fixed points of, of this transform. In fact, you can even uh, you can really formalize it in a more precise way in terms of fixed points. Uh, the same is true also for the for the extreme statistics. Actually, uh, there is a series of uh, recent papers by. Uh, Eric Bertin, Zoltan Rax, and, and, and uh, five years ago, uh, where they do this. Uh, yeah, does the function in the yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, I will not uh, comment too much on that, but yes. Yeah, the, the question was, is fractional calculus important? Yeah, so, <clears throat> yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, it could be interesting. I don't know, maybe uh, I can write. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, maybe I can comment on that a little bit later. Uh, in a minute, I will, I, will, I will actually come back to that. But yes, that's true. Uh, I'm not very comfortable with this fractional compute calculus, but, but indeed, I mean, this, uh, they, they, they play a role in that, in that, uh, in that case. So uh, these are, I will come, maybe I, I will comment on that, uh, because uh, what I want to study is basically the, uh, I want to, to come back to this to this Brian Brian limit and come back to the so that's 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 all what I wanted to say at the moment uh, about the limiting forms of the propagators. Uh, later on, I will construct some more complicated objects, uh, uh, but at the moment, this is the only thing that I want to to stress. Now you see what I did here. Uh, I started with the discrete uh, equation. Let's, let's, let's do the, the, the sigma finite. What I did is that uh, I looked at the, the discrete uh, Kolmogorov equation for J, and I solved it exactly for finite n, and then uh, I obtained the large n limit and obtained this Gaussian behavior. Okay. So now I want to, to propose you, or to present you an alternative uh, description, which is also interesting, which amounts to look at the, the backward, or, so the forward or backward equation, so the Kolmogorov equation, and look at the continuum limit of this equation that we had. You remember that we had this recursion relation. And what I want to show you is that this recursion relation actually turns out to the standard diffusion equation when you take a proper uh, diffusion limit. Okay, so let's, let's do that now. Uh, and maybe uh, at the end of this, I can come back to your question about fractional calculus. So that's, uh, uh, so what I want to do is an alternative derivation of this result, if you want, at least for the Brownian case. Uh, by focusing on the Brownian limit and recovering the diffusion equation, okay? I, 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 since, since this morning, actually, I, I mean, I, I talked a lot about diffusion, uh, but uh, we haven't seen any diffusion equation. Uh, but of course, uh, it's there. And uh, you know that this Gaussian here is a solution of a diffusion equation, so I want to show you 
where, where this diffusion equation is. So let's do that. So I just want to discuss uh, the Brownian, Brownian limit and, uh, and the diffusion equation. So maybe it's uh, nice to, uh, to come back to, um, <coughs> to start directly actually with the, with the Brownian somehow. It's, it's probably useful to do that. Uh, let's start with the uh, with the diffusion equation that I showed you before. Okay, so I have v dot of t is zeta of t. Oh, sorry, I called it eta. So let's let's stick to this notation, eta. Well, eta is a is a Gaussian. Uh, eta is a, eta of t. Sorry, is Gaussian Gaussian white noise. And. Uh, I would like to write the backward, or so forward, if you want. Uh, yeah, let's let's focus on the forward. I would like to to, to to write the forward equation associated to that. Okay, but of course, if if I want to do this, I have to discretize my process. So I will just uh, imagine that uh, I have a nice discretized version of it. So first, uh, I need to recover what is that to to recall you what is what this is. So this is just zero. I mean, it, the zero, zero mean and delta correlated, okay? But of course, one has to give a meaning to this, uh, to this, to this quantity when you do some discretization. So I want to, uh, to, to have a discretized version uh, of, this, of this equation. And in other words, uh, what I will write is that this B dot of T uh, will just be uh, B of T plus delta T minus, so I, I, I just uh, introduce a discretized time if you want delta T, and I just want to use a B T plus delta T minus B of T, and uh, this will just be uh, delta T times uh, my, uh, my function here, okay, my, okay, so, now, what I need to do, of course, in the, I need to tell you uh, what this quantity becomes now, because this, in, in this discretized version, while this actually has, uh, is well defined, and it has to be regularized. So in other words, I need to regularize in some way uh, this delta, delta t minus t prime, and the correct way to do it is simply to say that uh, this eta square of t is just 2d two, two divided by delta t. Okay, so that's the discretized version of the, of, the, of the delta function. And that's obviously, I mean, dimensionally is correct, right? So delta function of delta of t has a dimension of inverse of time. So that's the only thing that I can imagine. And that's the way uh, I discretize this, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, Brownian motion version. Okay? So now I want to write the, the backward Fokker Planck, forward, sorry. Uh, uh, forward Fokker Planck equation or forward Kolmogorov. I told it, Kol I, I, yeah, I, I, it's better to call it Kolmogorov, in fact, but uh, it's almost, uh, it's not a Fokker Planck. So I want to, to, to write the, the Fokker Planck, oh, the Kolmogorov <laughs> equation, okay, for this discretized version, okay, and then take the limit delta t goes to zero. So Kolmogorov for the discretized Brownian motion. So I will just write the same equation that, that I wrote before, right? So in other words, uh, I will just write the following. So now it's, it works like that. So I will write G of X, what that, that I defined before. And I just look at what happens between t and t plus delta t. It is same. So during delta t, I will have one jump, okay, because the jumps happens within uh, a certain time, inter certain time interval delta t. And so that's that's how it that's how it reads, right? So it's basically I will just write it and comment. J of uh, I will have x minus. So here you see that you have eta delta t.
and then I have P of eta. And I have to sum over eta. Okay? <coughs> You're fine with that? So now I want to take the limit delta t goes to zero. So I will just tailor expand this, uh, this guy. Okay, I'm sure you have seen that many times. So I just tailor expand this guy for delta t goes to zero. So first term is just g of x. So let me write. OK, let's do it this way. First term is g of x. Now I have uh, a second term, which is minus half eta times delta t times the first derivative of j with respect to x. Yes? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's no, no, no. It's a, it's a good. Uh, yeah, it's just because I was uh, I was a bit uh, a bit sloppy. No, they are there, of course. Yeah. So if you don't mind, here I will not write them because it's a bit uh, boring. But they are here. <laughs> okay. So I don't write. Or may maybe I can just write J like this, and you have to remind that J in fact stands for this, this guy. So here, sorry, in this line I use j for j of x, x naught, and t. Okay? So this is the first term. Uh, and then I have a second term. So second term of the Taylor expansion will give me uh, eta square, delta t square, and now I get the second derivative. Okay, I claim that I can stop here because this will generate higher orders of delta t here. And then I have p of eta d eta. Okay? So now let's try to, uh, so I have three terms. But you see that j does not depend on eta, dj dx does not depend on eta. It's the same for the second derivative. So eventually, uh, what I get is relatively simple. I get that g of x, x naught t plus delta t is, OK, so I have this first term here, which is just j times the integral over eta of p of eta, which is just 1, OK? Now I have a second term here. Let me write it. This is minus half delta t times j times the first moment, d eta eta. Sorry? Uh, the minus half, uh, there is no minus half. Thank you. OK, so that's the second term. Sorry? Yes, I'm getting tired now. Yes. OK? And then the third term, which is here, which is just, now let me take care, 1 half delta t square, second derivative of j. Now I have an integral, which is minus infinity to plus infinity, uh, eta square p of eta, right? So now you see what happens. This one is 1. This is fine. This one is 0 because the, the, the mean value of eta is 0. So this term disappears. And I get only the second term. So this term, I mean, superficially is of order delta square. But in fact, you have to remember that this guy is 2d over delta t, so that this term is actually of order delta t itself. Okay? Now you can also get that the higher order terms, of course, will be uh, of higher order of t. And then eventually, you get the equation in discrete time when delta t goes to 0, and we are almost there. <coughs> so eventually, you get uh, this equation that you have j of x, 
x naught t plus delta t, which is just j of x, x naught t plus 2. So this is just d times delta t times the second derivative. Okay, so now when you take the limit when delta t goes to 0, uh, obviously uh, you get your equation. And the equation that you get uh, is nothing else but indeed the equation, the diffusion equation as expected. So, as, you, as I told you and as you probably were expecting it. Right? Now, this diffusion equation, of course, uh, we know how to solve it because uh, there is uh, an additional, diffu I mean, initial condition that we have, which is that at t equals zero, this has to be a delta function. <coughs> and if you solve it, as you can imagine, uh, you would basically uh, obtain that j of x, x naught d, uh, is of this form, right? Is uh, one over four pi dt exponential minus x minus x minus x square divided by four dt. Okay, so that's the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay. So that's the. That's the answer that you get from this direct uh, continuum approach of the diffusion equation. And that's also, of course, what we got before, right? So uh, as expected, uh, the two approaches are coinciding uh, and uh, we are quite happy, we are quite happy with that. So um, maybe just one comment to your question. So if you do, if you want to do something like that, uh, but I will be brief. <laughs> If you want to do something like that uh, for Levy flights, I mean, of course, you are facing one problem, which is that eta square will not be defined. So you are not allowed to do that. And in fact, what happens is that you can show that uh, the correct way uh, to do this expansion is indeed uh, to introduce a fractional derivative of j with respect to x. And that's how it comes. And indeed, uh, essentially, what, what happens is that uh, you will not have the second derivative here, but the fractional derivative of order alpha uh, on that side. And now you immediately see that, I mean, the standard way to solve this equation is to look at the Fourier transform. And in Fourier transform, this second derivative here translates to a Q square, in, while in, in, if you have the, the fractional derivative of, of, of order alpha, that will be modulus of Q to the power alpha, and that gives you the, the alpha stable. So that's right. Okay, in general, it's, uh, I think it's, it's okay, at, at least that's my point of view. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it, it's probably quite difficult to, to, to uh, it's one way, it's one way to do, but uh, I usually, as I said, uh, I think that uh, when you have to, to deal with Levy flights, uh, it's really much nicer to work with, uh, uh, I mean, in discrete time and look at the large end limit. That's why I, I showed this first approach. Well, the, the thing is that uh, in the large end limit, then you really have a good analysis. Uh, I mean, you have good tools to analyze what happens in the large end limit, which are basically standard um, tools of analysis. While here, if you want to start with these fractional operators, it's a mess, I mean, from my point of view. It's very hard not to say, uh, I mean, to say precise things and correct things when you start to deal with this, uh, with this stuff. So this is a recommendation. If you have Levy flights, I think it's better to, to, to do it with a discrete time. OK, so uh, in the few minutes that, 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 I, uh, uh, that are left, uh, I want to introduce to the subject, uh, um, I mean, to a last part uh, concerning this uh, Brownian uh, and random walks and, 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 Brian, and Brownian motions and Levy flights, uh, which has to do with survival and first passage. OK, so I will just probably uh, just give some definitions today. Uh, and then uh, the main results, I guess, will come tomorrow, uh, except if I'm very fast, but uh, that's not the idea. 
Okay, so I, I hope that I gave you a good panorama of, of uh, what a good overview, say, of uh, uh, this uh, duality between uh, discrete and continuous uh, in the case of uh, random walks uh, with a finite sigma. Uh, and I hope I clarified some, uh, some ideas uh, about these different objects, which are random walks, Levy flights, and Brownian motions. So now, for all these uh, this, this, uh, this, uh, stochastic processes, uh, there is a central question, uh, which is relevant for extreme statistics, but which is actually also relevant uh, in many other uh, domains, uh, which has to do with the notion of survival probability. Uh, and um, what is usually called first passage problem. So let's try to, uh, to see what, uh, what it is. And the first object uh, to define uh, is basically, uh, so up to now we, we looked at this Green's function, but this, this was a free Green's function, okay? So I had this random walk, it starts at x naught, it arrives at x, and I ask what's the probability for such an event, but the random walk could go anywhere in between. Now, I'm constraining my, uh, my, random, my random walk, And the way I constrain it is the following. So I, I just look at this kind of trajectories. So it starts, say, at x naught. And OK, I want to ask what's the probability that it arrives, say, at x after n steps. But now I'm putting some constraint. I'm saying that I don't want the random walk to be negative. OK, so that means that I, I, don't, want, I don't want it to cross this axis. So that's, that means that I will only consider this kind of, uh, of, uh, of random walk, like that. OK, so it has to stay positive. So in other words, uh, this, I don't want to, to count this, uh, this kind of trajectories. OK, so suppose that I would have uh, trajectories of that, of that kind. Could be like this. Uh, this one, I don't want it. The, for the free propagator, uh, that would be okay, okay? But this one uh, is not allowed, okay? Because I'm saying, essentially, I mean, you can imagine that, okay, you, you know, one or more, as soon as it arrives here, it gets absorbed, and it, it sort of dies, right? So uh, it will never reach X. So this, this, this one is not allowed. So, and that means what? Uh, that means, so mathematically, uh, the, the, the object that I want, that I want to, 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 to construct, uh, maybe let's write it here. So I will write this Green's function as g plus of x, x naught n, which is basically the probability that, again, uh, the walker uh, is in x. Okay, okay, so this times dx, sorry. after n steps, so that was like before. But now I want, in addition, that x1 is strictly positive, x2 is strictly positive, etc. xn minus 1 strictly positive, given uh, that I started, well, x, of course, has to be positive also, but given that I started at x0. OK, so that's a quite complicated object if you think about it a little bit. And uh, computing it directly is very hard. Uh, now, it turns out that, again, this uh, approach that I showed before, this approach of uh, writing recursion relation forward and backward equation uh, are, quite, are quite useful. So uh, one can write this recursion relation. Of course, I mean, these are the same as before. I mean, the idea at least are the same, so I can derive, I, I can exploit the Markov property of the chain of the random walk, if you want, here. And again, I can write, uh, if I, I just specify what happens during the last step or during the first step, I will obtain two kinds of equations, and these are these forward and backward equations. Okay, so let's write them. I will have the forward, so I will have G plus uh, sorry, I, I prefer to write with G plus like that because my notes are with that. So. 
So I have the, f the forward one, which is as we wrote. So basically, uh, that's the, the same. So here I, I arrive in x prime and x naught. And then I, I will do the, the last jump between x and x prime. And then I can integrate over x prime. But of course, now x prime has to be positive, right? Because this intermediate point here cannot be negative, because otherwise my, my work is, 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 is dying, OK? So that's a difference, because it's not, it's not really a convolution anymore. Because here, I don't have the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. So somehow, I'm breaking space translation. And if I break space translation, I cannot use any more uh, Fourier transform. And that's really a, that's really a pity, because uh, things become much more difficult. So this is the forward. But you will see that here, yeah, the backward is much nicer. And I will, you will see why in a minute. So. so I can do the same, but for the, for the, for the backward. And that, that's just g plus of x, x prime 0 in n minus 1. And then I just make the jump between x prime 0 and x 0. But now I integrate over x prime 0 by the same constraint force. OK, so I mean, I'm writing it a bit fast, but this is exactly what we wrote before. I mean, the only difference, again, is that the intermediate points, which we are integrating over here, needs to be positive, because our work is positive. Okay, so that's really, uh, this is, this is a nice, the nice, uh, I mean, the, the important point to notice. Okay. It's not minus infinity. Now, this, these are the Green's function. Uh, now, there is actually uh, another quantity, uh, which, we, uh, which, which will be very important in the following, which is called the survival probability. So what is the survival probability? Well, the survival probability is starting from x0 up to step n is basically the probability that starting from x0, you stay in this half plane up to step n. Okay, so that means that what's the probability that starting from x0, you have not crossed the origin up to time t. Okay, so that's uh, the definition of the survival. Survival probability. And that will be our central object uh, in the following. So I will denote it by Q of x naught n. And that's really a probability in this case. This is sometimes called persistence probability. And uh, this is a true probability in the sense that this is just the probability that x1 is strictly positive, x2 is strictly positive, xn is strictly positive, given that you started at x0, which has to be positive, OK, also. OK? Now, what's the relation with, uh, with this guy there, with uh, g plus? Well, you see, I mean, uh, if you want to compute this probability, you just need to look at the Green's function. That means the probability that you arrive at, from, at x. And then you just need to integrate these probabilities over x for any x positive. OK? So the statement is that I look at all the probability that drives me from x0 to x. So this is this probability that I arrived within x and x plus dx. And then I just integrate over all the possible values of x. Right? Good. So that's, that will be really a central object in the following. And I will just end up uh, with the following remark, which is actually quite important, is that uh, if you look at this, one of these two equations, uh, there is one which immediately gives you a nice equation for Q. So indeed, I mean, if you look at this backward equation, and if you just integrate over x, so on the left-hand side, you would obtain simply Q of x not n. Now, if you look at this side, well, you can also integrate over x, because x here is just a dummy variable here, right? Completely x does only appear on g plus here. So that means that if you integrate over x, then that's just q of x prime 0 and minus 1. And of course, this remark obviously does not hold in this case, because if you integrate over x, 
well, you integrate over this guy, and you don't know what you are doing. So the nice thing is that if you integrate by integration of the back rub equation, and that's why it's so important here, uh, integrating uh, the backward equation. Uh, so again, what you obtain is that Q of X naught N itself satisfies a backward Kolmogorov equation. So that means simply here, X zero prime of Q, X prime zero N minus one, P of X prime zero minus X naught. Okay. So that's quite important. And um, so that will be our starting point uh, for last time. And um, I will show you basically that, uh, okay, I will not uh, comment on all the details, of course, but it turns out that this, essentially this equation can be solved uh, for any P, okay? The solution is a bit convoluted, but uh, there exists a fairly almost explicit expression for Q uh, in terms of P, so that's, uh, that will be the subject of last time. Uh, let me just comment on one thing maybe here on the boundary conditions, because of course the boundary conditions are a bit different for G plus and Q, uh, and I just want uh, to mention them to be complete, and then uh, I will be done. So there are various uh, boundary conditions for Q. Uh, the first one is that at n equals zero, and if you start at x naught here, after n equals zero, well, it, the probability to survive has to be one, right? I mean, you didn't move. So that means that for n equals zero, Q of x naught, has to be one, okay? So that's boundary and initial conditions. <laughs> so the first one indeed, as I said, is that at step zero, your particle starts and it has obviously to be one uh, for all x not positive or zero, okay, that's a uh, small caveat, I mean small, not caveat, but something that I will maybe discuss to this chapter. And there is another a boundary condition, where I just let, let you think about it, but uh, obviously, I mean, if I start from infinity, so that means that x naught, if, if, if x naught goes to infinity, then obviously, I mean, I have a probability one to survive for any n. It sounds like a bit peculiar boundary condition, but So that's, these are uh, my boundary conditions, and we will see how we can uh, solve these things later. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I did, well, no, I, 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 well, I don't know what happens for n goes to infinity. You will see it's, it's, it's quite non-trivial. Maybe since I mentioned first passage, uh, let me just, uh, No, okay, maybe it's too much. Okay, uh, I will stop here. Okay, thank you.